Hey, Michael, good to see you again. Are you in good health? Yes, thanks for asking, Luis Roberto. Great to see you. How about you? Me too. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you. We've been doing terrible in, in the pandemics, as you know, but uh, I'm, I'm well. And uh, it's been a tough year because we had general, we had elections here. And I am, you know, I am a Supreme Court justice, but I am also the head of the Superior Electoral Court. So I was in charge of organizing the, the elections in the middle of the pandemic, as, as, as you did too. Yeah. And but everything went well, thank God. <laughs> That's we're, good. We're surviving. That's good. And okay, so have you been teaching uh, normally, or you're using video? How are you doing? Well, at Harvard, the entire academic year was taught remotely. A few, some, a few of the students were allowed back on campus, but all of the courses were done remotely. So we've all had to adapt to that. Yeah. Well, it was pretty much the same here. Uh, it, unfortunately, in, in some parts of Brazil, the quality of the internet was not good enough for that. So yeah. we had, uh, for a certain period, kids that could not uh, have classes because of poor internet. And that's one good thing uh, that we can extract, uh, Michael, from this humanitarian crisis, it, it, we now have a focus of light in the inequalities in Brazil and in, in deficiencies in infrastructure, uh, sanitation, housing. Uh, I, I think it um, highlighted the perception that we need to fight poverty more fiercely and, and with a higher commitment. And uh, I'm hoping that this can be a positive output, I would say, of this tragedy. And- uh, I know what you mean. I know what you mean that the pandemic everywhere, I think has highlighted inequalities that existed before the pandemic, but that we see more clearly now, um, you mentioned infrastructure and internet access. I've been struck by how the pandemic has highlighted the divide between those of us who have the luxury of working from home, holding meetings on Zoom, and uh, those who have either lost their jobs or in order to carry out their work, have to face risks that the rest of us um, are at a certain distance from. And I'm uh, hoping that this could be, um, that, that this makes clear to all of us how deeply we depend on workers we often overlook. Not right. just the hospital workers, but delivery workers, warehouse workers, grocery store clerks, home health care providers, child care workers. And these are not the most, these are not the best paid and most honored workers in our society. And yet now we are calling them essential workers. So I'm hoping that this could be the beginning of a broader debate about how to bring their pay and recognition into better alignment with the importance of the work they do. And so it's one, one thing I, uh, a hopeful thing, I think, that might come from the pandemic. I think that's a great insight. Just to, to mention, this this is our conversation is to celebrate the tenth anniversary of your of the launching of your book here. So, uh, see, I this is the edition I have, uh, the original in English that I bought in Cambridge in 12, 2011, mm -hmm. If you can read it here, I can. Yeah, and then I, I have this one in Portuguese with your autograph that <laughs> makes it unfungible, which is pretty good. <laughs> All right, great. I also read a good part of this compilation that you made with the many of the texts on which you based your, your, your book that has the success it, it deserves. And, and uh, I'm very happy to be here with you uh, celebrating this uh, 10th 
uh, anniversary since it was uh, launched here. And I think it, it's a book, uh, Michael, that helped to democratize political philosophy because I think that one of the main characteristics of the way you write is converting sophisticated and complex ideas in a clear, simple objective uh, words, which allowed many people that otherwise would not be reading philosophy to be acquainted with, with ideas uh, that are very important and, and help people uh, not only improve their knowledge, but live a better life with, with basic ideas. So uh, the first thing I wanna do once again is, is congratulate you for, for this book. I've, I, I have the other ones, What Money Can't Buy and, and the most recently on, on meritocracy. But today we're gonna talk about, uh, about justice. And one, one thing I wanna ask you, is uh, it, it, your book, you, it, it's a book in, in which you give a lot of information, uh, but actually you don't try to give many answers. You try to make the reader find his or her own answers. Is, is that a correct assessment? Yes, and I, I just want to add uh, reacting Luis Roberto, to what you said a moment ago. First, I, I feel honored and privileged to be in dialogue with you on the anniversary of the Brazilian publication of Justice. That means a great deal to me. And I love the way you describe it as democratizing philosophy, because this goes right to the heart of what I take to be the role of political philosophy in informing our lives. Very often people hear philosophy and think it must be an intimidating, abstract, distant activity. We often think that philosophy resides in the heavens, in the clouds, far beyond the world uh, in which we live. But I've always thought that philosophy belongs not in the heavens, but in the city where citizens gather and where we struggle to resolve the dilemmas that we encounter in politics and in our everyday lives. And this in a way goes back to the origins of philosophy in the Western tradition. Socrates didn't give any lectures. He didn't write any books. He wandered the streets of Athens and encountered people and asked them questions. Some of them were famous exalted people. Others were ordinary citizens and working people. And the idea that philosophy is about dialogue and encounter makes it accessible, I think, or should make it accessible to everyone because everyone is concerned with thinking through how to live a just life, how to live a good life. And, uh, and I think everyone has this internal need of seeking justice. Uh, the problem is that we see it differently yes. uh, because the, the world is diverse. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is that you, you present uh, the most important uh, philosophical trends that has you know, crossed uh, mankind since uh, the since the Greeks, I would say. So you have, you have two of my favorites. I'm not a philosopher myself, but I like to read them. And I, I like uh, Aristotle very much. And I like uh, Immanuel Kant very much. And, it's, uh, and you have chapters on them. But it's, it's fascinating the way that you explain like utilitarianism for lay people. Uh, and the trolley example has, you know, crossed the world, and you know, people uh, seeking the right uh, answer. Uh, libertarianism, it, you explore it in, in a very interesting uh, way. Uh, Kantian ethics, and you know, founded in, in human dignity and motivation, and and 
um, a, uh, an individual uh, autonomy, uh, you were, I, I found that you were a little bit critical of, uh, uh, of uh, egalitarian liberalism. Can we talk a little bit about this, about Raw's idea of justice? And uh, I would like to hear you elaborate a little bit more about that. Yes, of course. Well, Rawls was, John Rawls was uh, perhaps the most important political philosopher in the English speaking world of the 20th century. And his famous book, A Theory of Justice, criticized the dominant utilitarian way of thinking about justice. The utilitarian uh, approach to justice says, figuring out what rights we have simply depends on figuring out what will maximize the overall level of happiness, what will create the greatest balance of pleasure over pain um, in, uh, among human beings. Um, I disagree with this philosophy. I suspect you do too. And so does John Rawls. And John Rawls provided a powerful critique of utilitarianism. He said, justice can't simply mean adding up collective welfare or happiness, because if that were the case, suppose there were a small religion that many people disliked on the utilitarian calculus. If enough people disliked this religious faith strongly enough, made them very unhappy to know that people were practicing it, then there would be an argument that the right thing to do is to ban that religious faith, even though it would violate the religious liberty of those who believed in it. So this, now utilitarians try to find ways around conclusions like this, or if enough cheering Romans in the Colosseum like the bloody spectacle of gladiatorial contests, throwing Christians to the lions, then even though the, the victims suffer great pain, the collective happiness of the cheering Romans packing the Colosseum would say, the utilitarian answer is to let the games go on. So John Rawls says that's the wrong way of thinking about justice. The rights secured by justice are not subject to political bargaining or the calculus of social interest. That's how he, he begins the book. And he, I think he's right about this. He argues instead that a just society consists of respecting fundamental rights, right to freedom of speech and to religious liberty and so on. And it would allow only those social and economic inequalities that would work to the advantage of the least well-off members of society. So he's against utilitarianism and he's against a pure laissez-faire free market way of distributing income and wealth. And so on both of these points, I agree with John Rawls. So, but you wanna know where I disagree. Is that, that's the, that's the challenge, yes. Louis yeah. Where I disagree, is Rawl says the way we should arrive at the principles of justice that specify our rights is to set aside our particular conceptions of the good life, our particular moral and spiritual convictions, because after all, in pluralist societies, people disagree about virtue, about the best way to live. We disagree about moral and spiritual questions, so if we're to arrive at principles of justice that everyone can affirm, we should try to make those principles neutral with respect to our deepest moral and spiritual convictions. That's where I disagree. I think it's a mistake to think it's possible to derive and defend principles of rights and of justice that don't presuppose a certain conception of the good of the best way to live. And I think the attempt to be neutral can have a damaging effect. It can empty public discourse of robust debate about 
the moral convictions citizens have and care deeply about. And the more we empty public discourse about fundamental questions of moral content, we create a kind of vacuum of meaning that can't last for long, that eventually will be filled, I think, I fear, by narrow intolerant moralisms, usually in the form of religious fundamentalism or in the form of strident nationalism. And that I think is what we've seen in many countries in recent decades to the extent that we have emptied out the public sphere, pretended that it's possible to be neutral on fundamental questions about the good life. And so this I think is a weakness of the version of liberalism that John Rawls, whom I greatly admire, that his theory uh, opens the way for. That's my disagreement. But what do you, no, what do you think a, about that? What, do you, that was you, a very you, clear explanation. And I, I do agree with you that we need some substantive values uh, to go on. But I, I think in, in certain matters, especially the ones that are very de divisive in society, I think that the liberal approach can do us well. And now I'll pick the most controversial issue of our times, or one of them, which is abortion, uh, which is, as you know, is still a crime in, in Brazil. And I am, of course, as any normal person against abortion in the sense that I don't think it's anything good, but I think criminalization is a bad public policy. So the way I argue for it and I vote for it is to say, this is a matter where you have a uh, reasonable moral disagreement. So when you have a reasonable moral disagreement, the role of the state is not to pick one side, is to assure every person to live his or her own creed, his or her own belief. So if you criminalize it, you do not accept someone to be different and to think different. So the liberal approach would be you, if you don't agree, you don't do it. You can preach against it. You can convince people not to do it, but you should not criminalize. And if you think that you, in, you are in a position that you need to perform an abortion, you have the right to do it. So this would be sort of a neutral uh, position that I think would be proper in, in a morally controversial issue. Uh, th that's the point I like the liberal approach. So now I listen to you. Okay, uh, I, I agree and I disagree uh, with the position you've described. I agree that abortion should not be a crime. And I agree that there should be a right for women to make the decision for themselves. Where I disagree is that it's possible to come to this conclusion, the one you and I share about what the policy should be with regard to abortion. I disagree that this position is really neutral on the underlying moral and theological question of the moral status of the developing fetus. Because if the, uh, the Catholic Church's position, theological position is right, if human, a human person exists from the moment of conception and as the fetus develops, then it follows that an elective abortion, let's say, put aside abortions for the sake of saving the life of the mother, we could uh, address that sure, separately. Sure. But then, but if, if the Catholic doctrine is true, then an elective abortion does amount to the taking of the life of a human person for the sake of um, answering the desire of the person who wants the abortion. And 
generally speaking, we don't allow people, even who may have good reasons, to kill an innocent human person. We don't. Now, so what does that say if you and I both agree that abortion should be permitted? I think what it says is we are implicitly concluding, both of us, that the, the Catholic theological position can't be right. Because if we were persuaded that it were right, it would be very difficult for you or me to defend the right to an abortion. So my arg, here's where we come back to neutrality. We agree, you and I, that the abortion should not be a crime, but I maintain that that commits me not to a neutral position on the theological debate. It commits me at least implicitly to rejecting, and perhaps I can provide arguments for rejecting, the doctrinal Catholic theological view about the moral status of the fetus. That's the sense in which my position is not neutral, even though the position corresponds with yours. What would you say to that? Well, I, I would say that the precise moment in which life begins is a matter of faith or of a philosophical conception. Right. Not exactly a matter of science. Right. So I don't think there is a precise right answer. I yeah. can accept the view of the Catholic Church, and I can accept the view of someone who thinks that life begins at a later stage, like when the, the nervous system starts to build or, or conscience or whatever other right. criterion. So since there is not a right answer for this question, and you have two reasonable different positions, I go back to my liberal argument, the state should be neutral because there are two reasonable views that can be considered. And you should not impose one, you should let people choose whichever view they, they prefer. That's why I, I think a liberal neutral view would, would work. But uh, Michael, I picked probably the most difficult uh, case uh, because it involves religious sentiment of people. And as you know, as a philosopher, uh, when you are debating about philosophical arguments, you need to have an open mind even to change your conceptions. But when you are talking about religion, you're talking about dogmas. You are talking about premises that you cannot change. So it's, it's a useless debate. I, I only, you know, the only thing you can do and I do is, is to respect uh, the religious views, but you, you, you cannot try to convince a Catholic that life does not begin at conception, because if, if he concedes that he is failing his, his faith and, and his doctrine. So uh, I, I do accept, uh, like uh, Dworkin, for example, who I also admire a lot, but I think that for certain questions, there is not just one right answer. In some matters, you need to concede that different people will have different reasonable positions. And all you can do is try to make them live in harmony without you know, clashing. Right, well, I would say that this is, a, this is a very difficult philosophical question. It's one thing I would say to acknowledge that there are reasonable and incompatible views at stake in the debate about the moral status of the fetus. But I wouldn't necessarily conclude from that that there is no right answer to the question. Either the, the, um, the Catholic position on the moral status of the fetus is true or it's not. And if that's the case, then there is a right answer to this question, even though it may very, be very difficult to find it 
or to persuade one another to change our minds uh, about this question. So I would distinguish between uh, uh, your observation, which I agree with, that reasonable people can disagree, but I would not conclude from that that therefore there is no right answer to the question. A related controversy that perhaps we could discuss if, if you like is the debate about same-sex marriage because many liberals say, uh, as you have said in discussing the abortion case, uh, the reason that we should have and permit same-sex marriage is that we should be neutral on the underlying moral uh, uh, question of what really is the purpose of marriage and what is the moral status of same-sex intimacies. I would defend the right of same-sex marriage, but I would not claim that my defense of it is morally neutral. To the contrary, I think the case, the, the, the case to be made for same-sex marriage is that the purpose of marriage is not solely for the sake of procreation. Because if it is, then we would, uh, we would not allow heterosexual uh, couples to marry unless they attested that they were going to have children or indeed that they were capable of having children. It, it, so I, I do think that it's possible, now, now much of the debate about same-sex marriage is really a debate about competing conceptions of what the purpose of marriage is, but those who say the purpose of marriage is procreation though they have that view, uh, I don't think that view is invulnerable to argument or not open to challenge. And I think that, that the case for same-sex marriage depends on challenging that view, that underlying moral conception about the purpose of marriage and uh, trying to persuade those who reject same-sex marriage uh, to broaden their conception of the purpose of marriage to include a lifelong loving relationship, whether or not it issues in procreation. Now that debate may be difficult and people may disagree about the purpose of marriage, certainly they do, but I don't think it's possible to make the case for same-sex marriage, as I certainly would wanna make it, while being neutral with regard to that underlying moral and sometimes religious question. What, what do you think? Michael, I think that's a much easier question, the same-sex marriage. I don't know if you know, when I was a lawyer, I was the lawyer that uh, defended the case of same-sex civil union before the Supreme Court, which paved the way for same-sex marriage. So I was pretty much involved in the, in the discussion. And I think it's much easier than abortion because it does not involve a third party like the abortion, abortion discussion would involve if you would consider the fetus as being uh, alive. So when we talk about same-sex marriage, we are talking about two consenting adults making choices for their lives. So there, there are no third parties involved. Of course, there are some third parties more of values involved, but not uh, a direct interest like the life of, uh, of a, a fetus. So I, I think this is a, a morally easier question than, uh, than abortion. Uh, and I have a, an interesting uh, experience to tell you. I, I had in my firm, when I was a lawyer, a wonderful woman that worked very closely with me who was a, a Baptist, a Protestant, and very devoted. And so she told me, I don't want to work in this case with you. And I tell her, don't you think it's much more Christian to help these people that suffer so much prejudice and discrimination? And so once we are on their side and make their life easier, uh, we're doing the right thing, as you like to say, what's the right thing to do? Uh, and she tells me, I understand what you're saying, but the Bible is literal about the prohibition of homosexuality. And once she told me that, I didn't argue anymore because that was a dogma. She thinks that the Bible is the word of God and she cannot go against it. 
So again, we reach a point, uh, as I see it, that the only thing you can do is respect the other person's view and defend that she or he respects other people that think differently. Uh, but I, I do agree with you that in, in a, a, a Aristotelian fashion, that if we try to identify the purpose of things, I clearly think like you stated, that the purpose of marriage is to share a common life and procreation is uh, one possibility, but it's not a necessity. So it's very clear to me uh, because otherwise older people, people that are not fertile anymore could not marry and we don't think that. Right. And besides, I read once, Michael, and, and to finish my, my point, a conservative argument in favor of same-sex marriage, which was, we think marriage is a good thing. So if we think it's a good thing because it, uh, you know, builds warm relationships, that uh, reduces promiscuity and, and things like that. If, if we think it's a good thing, why would we exclude people from doing it just because their sexual orientation is different? So I, uh, I, I don't feel very impartial because I was the attorney in this case, but it seems fairly obvious to me that one's religious belief cannot preclude the happiness of someone else. And I think it's, it's a more pious attitude to accept even though you don't agree with it. What do you think? I think that the, the first argument you made to your colleague, uh, the, the Baptist woman who didn't want to work with you on the case, um, don't you think you said it's the more Christian thing to do to appreciate and to uh, and, and promote and honor the desire of a same-sex couple with a loving relationship to live their lives together. I think that impulse of yours was trespassing on, uh, can, uh, on her or attempting to trespass on religious questions in a beautiful way. You were trying to appeal to her religious beliefs, to where she was coming from, and to try to persuade her. And so you were arguing in my way, <laughs> Luis Roberto, you were using a rhetoric of the good and of, of, of what the best interpretation, as you saw it, of her Christian faith actually uh, uh, permitted and maybe required her to, to do. Now, it turned out that you didn't reach agreement. She didn't see it that way. She had a different interpretation of what her Christian faith required with regard to same-sex marriage than you thought the Christian faith did. But that was the first step, kind of step along the, the mode of argument that I'm favoring, which is to set aside the pretense to neutrality and to try to persuade, to try to reason with one another without insisting that matters of, of, of purpose or of faith or of the good life cannot be open to argument. I would disagree. So that's where I agree with you. I think that was, that was a, uh, <laughs> a good impulse, though not one that strictly speaking observes the uh, precepts of liberal neutrality. That's my, my main point to tweak you about it. But here's, Here's my more fundamental disagreement. Yes, uh, civil unions do uh, are unions among consenting adults. And so long as the civil unions are done independently and voluntarily, it's true. There is no third party. But with same-sex marriage, that's not strictly speaking the case. There is a third party. And that third party is the state representing the, the political community. Because what separates same-sex marriage from purely private arrangements 
among consenting adults to live together is precisely the imprimatur of the state, the endorsement and the honor of the state representing the political community saying this, we are going to bless this, so to speak, though it's, it's a civil blessing. We are going to honor this relationship, not just as a private contract, but as a marriage. And when the state does that, the state is a very important third party. And this explains the passion in the debate over same-sex marriage. Some suggested early on in these debates that the best way to agree to disagree would be simply to allow same-sex couples to enter into private contracts, setting out their relationship and their intention to live together. But if that's all that were involved, there would have been no need for same-sex marriage. But the proponents of same-sex marriage understood, I think rightly, that purely voluntary privatized agreements to live together do not carry the, the approval and the honor that the state confers when the state finally said, yes, same-sex couples will now be included in the social institution, the state-sanctioned social institution of marriage. That's why the debate was so intense. That's why purely privatized arrangements were not enough because what was at stake was recognition, was honor, which I think is not a matter that can be decided neutrally. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think we're gonna leave it like that because the, the way I see it, if the state would not recognize and grant rights to a same-sex couple, it would be saying your affection and your love values value less than heterosexual people. Right. And I think that that would be very unfair. That would be a discrimination. So again, I, I think the state should play a neutral role in the sense that you don't have to do it, but if you wanna do it, I'll accept you. Again, uh, we, we might need, Michael, some other time, and now I'll, I'll do some home, homework, we might need to improve our ideas of neutrality uh, because uh, we, we might be having a little difference on, on what we consider neutral to be. Uh, because I think the state should be neutral. And, and you just said, if the state enters the business, it's not neutral anymore because you have this, this kind of uh, sanction, uh, public sanction. Uh, can I ask you, can I move on to a different, e e equally tough subject? I, I know that Massachusetts, where, where you live, uh, has decriminalized uh, marijuana. Uh, do you have views uh, on applying your principles of justice and your view of the common good, uh, how would you fit drug question in, in, your, in your philosophy, in your general philosophy? I don't think it's, a, uh, in general, I, um, I don't object to decriminalizing marijuana, mainly on practical grounds. I don't think that the police should be uh, devoting their enforcement uh, powers to trying to track down people who are using recreational marijuana. And I think that leads to other harms. Uh, I don't think that an overriding public good is promoted by encouraging people to uh, smoke marijuana recreationally, but, but neither do I think it should be criminalized. So I see it more as a practical question than a question of fundamental justice. Okay, so we agree uh, on that too. And what makes me very happy, I, I also think that illegal drugs are something bad. And of course, the, the, the role of the state should be to disincentivize people to consume illegal drugs. 
Uh, but the way I see, and it's a bit, much bigger problem where I live, uh, the, the war on drugs, uh, Michael, at least here has failed after uh, hundreds of thousands of deaths and imprisonment. Uh, it just keeps going up. And the power of drug dealers in poor communities is, is shameful uh, in, in countries like Brazil and, and other countries in, in Latin America. So it, it's, it's a lost war, uh, I basically uh, would say. And over time, the focus changed from protecting public health to criminal persecution. Yeah. And so in Brazil, around 30% of people incarcerated are there for uh, drugs, drug dealing, or crimes relating to drugs. And you usually arrest young people uh, and you just destroy their lives from throwing them in jail, into jail. And what's worse, the, the business of drugs, they replace this kid overnight. So you destroy lives, you destroy lives and you, you don't make any impact on, 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 yeah. on drug dealing. So I agree with you, it's, it's bad, but the criminalization has not done any good. So I, I would basically think of treating it as we have been treating uh, cigarette smoking. Uh, in, in Brazil, you cannot buy it if you are underage, you cannot make uh, advertisements and you have a fairly high taxation and you have campaigns to show people the risks, but it's still legal. And uh, probably in America too, the consumption of cigarettes has uh, decreased in, you know, very importantly. So I think fighting something under the light of the day could be a better option than criminalizing. I'm not totally sure though. So I think we should monitor and see how things will develop to make sure we are doing the right thing here too. Uh, but I, I uh, agree with you. It, it's not good, but criminalizing is, is even worse. And the point you made, for me, the most decisive point is the way uh, that we've created a system of mass incarceration, um, largely, through arresting people for drug use. I think we need to th fundamentally rethink the um, uh, uh, system of prisons and of mass incarceration. And a big part of that rethinking, I think, has to, uh, will have to involve reconsidering uh, the law with regard and, and the enforcement with regard to drugs. Okay, I think we are, we are debating all the hard issues that we can find uh, here and there. So I, I'll move on to a different one that you also treat in your book, which is affirmative action. Uh, we have in Brazil, unlike in, in the US, we have quotas. Uh, we have quotas in public universities in Brazil, and we have quotas for public jobs, public civil, civil services. And I supported it because I, I think it's, it's important for us. Brazil is, is a much more miscegenated country than, than the US, but still the color of the skin can make a big difference in your access to, to the marketplace and, and to higher uh, positions. And I support it. So I, I'll, I'll give you my reasons and then I'll, I'll listen to you. I support affirmative actions and even quotas because I have, I think we have a moral debt with the Afro-Brazilian community due to slavery. Uh, we have this, what we call structural racism because when these people were freed in 1988, they were not integrated to society. So they lived a marginalized life and, and subalternity was a trait of the Afro-Brazilian uh, community. And I'm also uh, pro-affirmative action because I think we need Afro-Brazilian symbols of success. We need to have these people in higher position 
positions in, in the public sector, in the private sector, so that the young uh, Afro-Brazilians can mirror them as an example, can admire them and can, can try to be like that. So these are my three arguments why I have voted for affirmative action. And even here at the electoral court where I am right now, we also decided that the public funding that goes to candidates during the campaigns, we do have some public funding. You should have the amount of public funding corresponding to the proportion of black candidates. So if you have 40% of black candidates, 40% of the funds should go to them. Uh, it was controversial, but I think it was very important and uh, the court ruled that way. So I wanna hear you a bit about affirmative action and, and how it, it fits your system of thought. I agree with um, all of the reasons that you just offered for uh, affirmative action in university admissions. Uh, I wasn't familiar with the campaign finance uh, regulation, which uh, I, th I find very interesting and encouraging. Um, so I agree with um, the reasons that you've uh, given in defense of affirmative action. And uh, I would only add that important as it is to uh, promote affirmative action for uh, members of black communities, Afro-Brazilian and uh, Afro-American in the case of the US, I think we should also extend affirmative action in university admissions on the basis of class background, those who uh, uh, have suffered uh, disadvantages uh, with regard to class. But I, I agree with all of the arguments that you've laid out, Luis Roberto. Okay. Uh, so I, uh, I would like to, me and the public, uh, we would like to, to have an, an assessment that you could make uh, before we close of, of, of your book, of your motivation to write it and the impact you think it brought to, to, to the world, to the intellectual community, to readers uh, more uh, generally. So uh, I, know, I, I know it's interesting because when we write a book and then we move on, to a different book and then to a different book, but there is one that becomes so uh, important and successful that people keep asking us to go back and, and discuss the, the first, uh, not first, but that, that specific one again. So uh, I think that uh, uh, me and the public that will read us, will be happy uh, to hear from you uh, some 10, 12 years after you've written it, how, how, you, how you felt when you wrote it, how you felt the impact, and mostly if you would do something differently uh, if you would write it today. Well, thank you so much, Luis Roberto, for those generous remarks about the, the Justice Book. It grew out of a course that I taught for many years. And uh, it's the, the book, like the course, attempts to relate big questions of philosophy to the dilemmas we confront in our everyday lives. I think that the, uh, the, the reception of the book uh, and its continued life reflects um, a certain hunger and yearning that I find everywhere I travel, especially among young people, but not only among young people, a hunger and yearning to reason together about big questions that matter, including questions of values and ethics. What makes for a just society? What do we owe one another as citizens? What does it mean to seek the common good. On one level, these are abstract philosophical questions that have been debated by philosophers for a very long time. 
But what I try, try to teach my students and what I try to convey in the book is that what these famous philosophers write about are not simply artifacts in the history of ideas. These are episodes in arguments in which we are still engaged every day. And I think it's a feature of the public life of democratic societies like ours, Luis Roberto, that our civic life isn't going very well. It's almost as if we've lost the capacity to reason together about hard questions, even to listen to one another and to engage in respectful dialogue about our civic life. Too often, what passes for political discourse these days consists either of narrow technocratic managerial talk, which inspires no one, or where passion enters, we have shouting matches, where partisans and ideologues shout past one another without really listening without addressing one another. This makes for an impoverished civic life. And so I think when I wrote the book and, and when it was published in Brazil now a decade ago, I think then as now, there's a great hunger for something better, for a more elevated kind of public discourse than the kind to which we've become accustomed. And this is how I account for the level of interest that the book has attracted. The hunger for, for philosophy, the desire to figure out big questions of meaning and to reason together, this goes back a very long way. I think it's, it's a universal hunger, maybe even a fundamental human need to figure out what's right and what's wrong and how to live our lives in ways that we can be proud of and derive meaning from. Uh, if I could, I would like to end with an experience I had during a visit a few years ago to Brazil. And I was in Rio at the time, and I had the opportunity to visit a favela and to meet with a group of community activists in the favela. And we sat around in a community center and we discussed um, questions of justice and injustice, equality and inequality, questions of violence, questions about citizenship and voice. And one of the people I met in that visit, during that visit, and someone who helped lead, helped lead the discussion with me was a man named Reginaldo. I think he was in his 50s. And he told me his story. He had grown up in the favela. He couldn't read until he was 25 years old, hadn't been to school. His job was as a trash picker. He would make, uh, make, uh, make a living going, pulling trash, discarded items from people's trash bins. And one day he found a tattered torn book in one of the trash bins. And he pulled it out and he, he tried to make some sense of it. The owner of the house saw him there, came out and asked him what he was doing. And the, the book, the torn book that Reginaldo had found, turns out was, the, it was about the trial of Socrates. It was one of Plato's dialogue. And the person who had discarded this torn book was, it was a retired professor. And so the professor taught Reginaldo to read through Plato's dialogues, taught him how to read, and Reginaldo became fascinated with Plato and with philosophy. And he came to read more and more. And then he began to relate that philosophy to the life that 
that he lived in the favela. Hence the gathering that I had with a group of community activists. And uh, many of whom Reginaldo had taught. And what struck me, and this goes back to what I was saying about Socrates when we began our discussion, his approach to philosophy. In many ways, Reginaldo and I are engaged in the same enterprise, in the same project of reading and learning about what famous philosophers of the past have written and trying to bring their questions into contact with the world in which we live. That seems to me philosophy, political philosophy at its best. And that in a modest way, Luis Roberto, uh, is my aspiration for my book, Justice. Michael, thank you very, very much. Uh, as uh, you know, uh, you were probably person on earth that made political philosophy more accessible to a lot of people and of course help them having a better life. I think you have the success uh, you deserve because you're brilliant, you're thoughtful, you're kind, you're caring. And uh, as I close this, I just uh, would like to quote a uh, phrase by Nelson Mandela that I think fits you very well when he said, a good head and a good heart are always a formidable combination. It was a pleasure to be with you here. It's a pleasure to be able to be a, to take a free ride <laughs> in the celebration of the 10th anniversary of your very successful book in Brazil. And I wish you all the best uh, always and that you can continue shedding light in the minds of young people. Uh, and I'll send you uh, through Sonia. My daughter was an exchange student in Harvard a couple of years ago, and she attended one of, of your lectures and she directed you a question. And I have the, the, the short film of it. And uh, I was very happy and proud to see that and how you know, kind you were in answering her. Uh, without knowing, of course, that she was my daughter. And it's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be able to meet with you. Uh, once in a while, we, we get to talk either here in Brazil or, or in the US, and hopefully the pandemic will go away and we'll have a glass of wine together sometime, okay? I look Take forward care. to that, Luis Roberto, and I'm so grateful to you for this conversation, for your generous words, and I look forward to the chance uh, when we can get together in person again. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you bye very bye. much. Bye-bye.